The court system is one of the three branches of government, one of the first structures set out by the U.S. Constitution. But the court system is also confusing. While Congress and the President make relatively simple arguments so they can appeal to the public and get re-elected, the courts seem to almost use their own language, making them fundamentally unaccessible. To some extent, this is on purpose. Most judges would probably prefer that you don't think too hard about their work. The more complicated the legal system seems, the less likely you are to feel confident enough to criticize it. But this attitude toward the courts ignores their enormous importance. Courts were vital battlegrounds in many of the key social battles of the 20th and 21st centuries. Courts have legalized gay marriage, banned employment discrimination against trans folks, catalyzed school desegregation, limited mass surveillance, protected abortion, and provided reprieve for immigrants. But they've also shielded the Trump administration from oversight, greenlit voter suppression and gerrymandering, undermined coronavirus containment, permitted the travel ban, and struck out against unions. In this video, I'll try to demystify the courts, unpacking how they work, who makes them run, and what they are empowered to change. I'll approach this in three parts. First, I'll talk about the role of the courts, then I'll talk about the structure of the courts, and finally, I'll talk about some debate arguments incorporating the courts that you may encounter. First, what do the courts do? Like the other two branches, the courts have staked out a clear role for themselves in our system of government. As Chief Justice Marshall said, it is to say what the law is. Where the legislature makes the law and the executive enforces it, the court's job is to interpret laws and determine how they apply in ambiguous cases. That means that if someone is affected by an ambiguity in the law, whether in a congressional enactment, a constitutional provision, or an executive order, they can ask the court to decide what the law for their case is. The idea that only someone affected by ambiguous laws can ask the court for help is a key element of how courts work. Whereas Congress and the President can seek out and fix problems proactively, courts have to wait for an issue to crop up and for the people involved in the issue to ask the courts for their input. Courts also have to be able to provide a remedy of some kind. Courts can't strike down laws that haven't passed yet or that have already been repealed. This is because courts don't make abstract pronouncements about the law. They only decide specific cases. This principle is encompassed within two doctrines. Ripeness, which is the idea that rulings shouldn't be made prematurely, and mootness, the idea that rulings shouldn't be made if the issue has already been resolved. Not just anyone can ask the courts for an opinion either. Only people who are injured by a law or by another person have the standing to ask the court to fix the issue. The fundamental job of the courts is to provide clarity to ambiguous legal issues. So on top of all of the other restrictions on how they can rule, courts must also be consistent, resolving similar cases in similar ways. The Supreme Court simply can't hear every single legal dispute in the country. Instead, when they make decisions, or opinions, they articulate general principles that informed those opinions, hoping that most of the time, people can use those principles to resolve ambiguous cases on their own. The court has a Latin name for this idea, stare decisis, which means let the decision stand. Under this principle, courts are very reluctant to walk back decisions they've made previously, since people rely on court interpretations to be stable over time. This means that when a court makes a decision, it sets precedent. Every future decision on a similar issue must refer back to past decisions, drawing comparisons between the past outcomes and rationales and the case at hand. Only rarely do courts reverse or overturn precedent. They do so when the law has changed or when the harm of allowing bad law to continue to exist outweighs the harm of admitting they were wrong. More frequently, however, judges wishing to change course deal with contradictory precedent by distinguishing the case at hand from similar cases in the past. This allows judges to change course without overturning their past decisions. The last important thing to know about the courts as a whole is that courts are not just legal actors, they are also political. Because courts neither enforce nor enact the law, they can only interpret law that already exists, they rely on other people to enforce their opinions, based on the belief that the courts are legitimate. As a result, courts have to be careful 
ensuring their legal interpretations don't move too far beyond the pale of what is legally and socially acceptable. In one famous example of court legitimacy failing, President Andrew Jackson ignored Chief Justice John Marshall's order that the federal government respect Native American sovereignty in the state of Georgia, declaring, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. On top of the requirement to maintain legitimacy, many state judges are explicitly political because they are elected officials and have to campaign for their positions. Now that we've talked about how the courts work as a whole, let's talk about the structure of the U.S. court system. The basic structure of U.S. courts is like a ladder. Cases enter at the lowest rungs, called trial courts, whose job is to determine the facts and make an initial ruling, and then they are reviewed at higher rungs, or appellate courts, whose job is to make sure that the trial courts applied the law correctly. These courts decide two types of cases. There are civil cases, where one person or entity is suing another person or entity, and criminal cases, where the government is suing a person or entity on behalf of society. Civil cases are very important, but we'll set them aside for now to talk about criminal cases. Each criminal case begins with an observed or reported crime. This is followed by an investigation, an arrest, a formal filing of charges, and if the crime in question is a felony, a grand jury. At each of these stages, the government is evaluating whether it has enough evidence to move forward with its accusation. The accused can plead guilty, admitting to the charges, or can plead not guilty, denying them. If they plead not guilty, the accused are tried, and the government has to convince a jury and a judge to convict and sentence. Every defendant who loses at this stage has a right to appeal to a higher court. This moves the case into a court of appeals, which reviews the case to ensure that no legal errors have been committed. Defendants who lose at this stage can appeal again, this time to the Supreme Court using a writ of certiorari. However, unlike courts of appeals, the Supreme Court can choose which cases it wants to hear and which ones it doesn't. The core idea behind the appeals process is to create bias in the defendant's favor. While errors that help the government can be corrected on appeal, errors that help the defendant stand since the government cannot appeal when it fails to get a conviction. Such systems exist at both the state and federal levels, with state courts applying state laws and federal courts applying federal laws as well as interpreting the federal constitution. There are 94 federal district courts, which are organized into 12 circuits, each of which has a court of appeals, called the Federal Circuit Court. At the top of the federal system is the U.S. Supreme Court, which has final say over all legal matters in the U.S. Each state has their own judicial system as well. Each state structures their judiciary differently, but most mirror the federal system, with trial courts feeding into appeals courts, which feed into the state Supreme Court. There are also a few other courts that Congress created to decide special cases. These courts exercise narrow jurisdiction, and come up much less frequently than the main body of the legal system. Since all federal courts are part of the U.S. federal government, they are arguably fair game on the majority of debate topics. Court affirmatives can be strategic, because they avoid many generic arguments that respond to congressional action, like the politics disadvantage or the elections disadvantage. Additionally, court affirmatives can argue that the plan sets precedents with sweeping implications that reach issues only tangentially connected to the year's topic, which provides them with an additional edge. However, the NEG still has some options to respond. First, what are some examples of generic disadvantages to court action? One popular example is the court politics disadvantage. This argument plays off of court's political motivations to argue that making a controversial decision now might cause courts to make a less risky ruling in another case. As an example of this, negative teams point to Chief Justice Roberts' ruling upholding Obamacare in 2012 and argue that this ruling was followed up by another case in which Roberts gutted the Voting Rights Act. According to the negative, this liberal ruling about Obamacare might have forced Roberts to balance with a conservative ruling. There are broader versions of this argument as well, 
The legitimacy good disadvantage claims that an unpopular ruling might injure the court's legitimacy, preventing its decisions from being followed, while the legitimacy bad disadvantage would say that the plan boosts the court's legitimacy, diffusing opposition to its bad actions or giving activists hollow hope in progressive litigation. Another popular example is the precedent disadvantage. This argument has to be tailored to the specific court's affirmative in question, and would argue that the precedent set by the plan is bad. This is the flip side of court precedent advantages that might be read by the affirmative. The negative can couple these disadvantages with some counterplan options. First, the negative can use agent counterplans. These counterplans use Congress or the executive branch to act instead of the court enacting a similar outcome, and avoiding disadvantages to court action. These counterplans might solve the main component of the affirmative, but will have a more difficult time making solvency claims about the precedent components of the affirmative. Second, the negative can use a counterplan to make the same ruling as the plan, but for different reasons. This would not solve any argument about why the plan might set a good precedent, but it would avoid disadvantages about that precedent too. These are just a few of the negative's many options to respond to a court affirmative. Remember, while using the court as an actor can help the affirmative avoid some negative arguments, it also exposes other weaknesses that a prepared negative team might exploit. On topics where legal arguments are very relevant, it is important that negative teams understand what they're up against and prepare to beat it.